we are really thrilled to have Dr. Martin Rothblatt with us. I mentioned it briefly before. I saw Martin at a keynote at South by Southwest, and I was um, absolutely inspired. Um, when Martin's daughter was diagnosed with an illness that risked her life, Martin left her job at Sirius, which some of you may know from the car satellite radio, but they did a lot more than that. A company she co-founded that currently has a market cap of over 20 billion US dollars. Uh, she left that job to develop treatments to save not only her daughter, um, but many others around the world. She has also fought on the legal front, uh, led efforts of the transgender community to, this, to establish their own health law standards. Her patented inventions cover aspects of satellite communication, medicinal biochemistry, and cognitive software. And you already notice how I'm reading it, that those are complicated things. Um, and uh, just sort of on the side, uh, Martin also designed the world's first electric helicopter and piloted it to a Guinness World Record for speed, altitude, and flight duration. Uh, Martin's recent books are on xenotransplantation, gender identity, and cyber ethics. She's the CEO of United Therapeutics, a biotech company developing novel technologies to help patients with lung and organ diseases. Martin really is one of the greatest innovators of our time, and we are thrilled to have her. Martin, please enter the stage. And please also enter the stage Laura Lewandowski, columnist, entrepreneur, podcast host for Business Insider and Red Bull. You two take it away, please, in the upcoming fireside chat. Hello. There is Laura. How are you, Laura? Good to see you. I'm great. How are you? Very good. And there's Martine. I leave it to you too. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Martin, how are you? I'm happy. Thanks, Laura. I'm happy too. I'm happy too. Honestly, that was quite a last minute thing for me that I jumped on the TOA panel now. But I briefly read your story. And since I'm a journalist, I was researching a lot. And when I first read it, I urgently felt the need to turn your life into a movie because it's so... Wow, it's amazing. And everything Nico said is very impressive, to be honest. So since everybody is talking about technology, I don't want to ask you about all the small details in your company because this is something we can read online as well. The thing I would like to talk about is more something that all of us can apply to our lives, no matter in which field we are working, and this is resilience. And so my first question to you is, how can someone handle so many challenges at the same time, saving your daughter's lives, building multiple companies, and also dealing with your own identity? Yeah, thanks, Laura. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, please don't make a movie of <laughs> life. I, I like just being a, uh, a technologist and, and creating technologies to try to improve the world. In fact, it's not possible to do all of those things at the, at the same time. We just have to deal with what's uh, most important in front of us. Um, for example, when uh, my daughter, whose name is Genesis, was in the intensive ward care at the hospital, and um, she, they, they um, predicted she would die in two to three years, um, nothing else mattered. Even though I'm a spacer by training and launching satellites, uh, my first love is uh, space exploration. I had to just put all of that aside and work on trying to find a way to save my daughter. So I didn't try to do both of those things at the same time. Hmm. Um, and what has helped you most to remain focused and really follow a roadmap? Because you basically solve two problems. You helped your daughter, but at the same time, you used all of these informations to turn it into something valuable for other people as well. So how can we imagine a day in your life or back in the days in that situation? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, Laura, I, this will probably sound a little bit uh, non-engineering and, and, um, and almost kind of spiritual. I love it. <laughs> in fact, I try to stay attuned to the energy patterns in the world around me. And I imagine that uh, all of the world and the reality 
it has these kind of energy meridians like we learn in uh, Chinese traditional medicine that the human body has these energy meridians flowing through it. And in things like acupuncture, they try to you know, address the particular energy meridians that are relevant to some ache or pain or other disability in the, in the body. And I tried to do the same thing in the real world. There are you know, billions of people and so many things going on at the same time. But there is a kind of, um, there was this, uh, this uh, Jesuit technologist, anthropologist in the 20th century named Teilhard de Chardin. And uh, he wrote about, there is a thing called a noosphere, uh, N-O-O sphere, which is the kind of collective consciousness of all of humanity. And there are certain energy flows that go through this. So as I um, find a, a lead that can help me to develop a medicine to help people, and I realize that uh, this particular medical condition is not being worked on by other companies. It's what we call a corridor of indifference, meaning like nobody's thinking about it, nobody's caring about it. So that kind of sucks my energy into something that nobody else is focusing on. And I talk to people about it. And if people want to jump on board, uh, great. Sometimes I jump on board with other people because they're always already there. My mantra, Laura, is just like kind of four words. It's um, it's first of all, to uh, be curious. If you are not open to the world around you, you won't see the meridians of energy. Okay, so secondly is to question authority. Uh, when people tell you, oh, this is not real, uh, this is not possible, always question it. They might be right, but they might be wrong. And most great inventions, everybody thought was impossible when the inventor started. Third, to act practically to not just think about the problem in your head, but say, well, how can I make this? How can I do this? And every idea, try to convert it to reality. And fourth and most importantly is to act lovingly, always to act that you want to make other people around you happier. Yeah, I love that. I'm, I'm feeling really inspired and I actually want to write everything because I have a pen here. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing this. Maybe I would allow myself to add another one because once you said persistence is so important as well. And if you don't give up, you won't fail. So what was your biggest learning on your journey? Yes, yeah, so um, my biggest learning was probably just what you said, Laura, that um, if you give up, you will certainly have failed by definition. And um, in developing a medicine where there are no medicines, it's, a, it's a, an opportunity to fail many, many times. Um, the, every medicine is of course a molecule or if it's a biologic medicine, it's a mix of, of thousands of molecules. And the human body is like a giant set of locks. And, um, and to get a molecule to fit inside the right lock, like a key in a lock, it's uh, more luck than, than foreknowledge. And you have to try a lot of different things. So it's very, very difficult to succeed in, in creating new medicines. It's the same in every field though, um, to create, for example, our electric helicopter. There's so many ways to fail and uh, the batteries are too heavy. The drag of the aircraft is too high. Uh, there's regulatory problems. I mean, it's the control systems. But if we had given up, we would have failed. So instead, I try not to give up. Now, that does not mean that you should like never adapt. Many times as you're working on a problem, you'll see that the pathway you're working on is not leading to success. You're not like, you know, I try to tell people I think of problems like um, big uh, sausages. Every problem is like a big sausage. And how do you eat a big sausage? Uh, well, the only way is one slice at a time. Okay, you just have to take it one slice at a time. So as I'm slicing through this sausage, if I see I'm getting to the end of it, it's like, yes, I'm not going to give up. It, I can't eat it all today. But if I eat a few slices a day, eventually I will finish this sausage. But sometimes you might be slicing and the sausage is not getting any smaller. It's the same size. And then you have to say, okay, there's something that I'm doing wrong uh, in addressing this sausage. My slices are not making any difference. 
So I have to adapt my approach. And I do not believe, uh, Laura, that there is any successful project where the founder, where the promoter, where the inventor, uh, where the mover of that project, if it's a social movement, did not have to adapt their approach many times to succeed. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Martine. And when we're already talking about failures or opportunities, and also you mentioned the word movement, I'm really interested in your opinion. Do you think technology can really liberate humans from the limits of their own biology, maybe infertility, disease, but also death? Do you think so? I do. I do think so. Um, and there are just too many examples to say that technology cannot liberate humans from their ailments. The first and, and simplest example to me is agriculture. It was a, a technology. Well, actually, even before agriculture, there was, you know, uh, bow and arrow, spears, all of these things uh, liberated us from weaknesses in our technology and allowed us to survive. As you know, there are some times when the number of humans, it shrunk to just like a few hundred and we could have almost been uh, wiped out. Technology is not always a machine. The bonding of humans and animals, especially dogs, I think is one of the most brilliant technologies in all of human development. And I, I know it's just a movie, but we were talking about movies and I'm sure it's not exactly mm -hmm. accurate and whatnot, but I love this movie called Alpha. I don't know if you've seen it or whatnot, mm -hmm. but it's a story about uh, how a small band of humans um, and, and a dog really were able to help each other survive during kind of ice age conditions. And to this day, we know that dogs help many people with the blood pressure and, uh, and psychiatric um, problems. So uh, technology does not have to be a machine. It could be a social technology. Cities are a social technology. So yeah, I, I do believe this. And then like eyeglasses, oh my God, like, you know, all us who are like always reading things, Uh, what if there was no glasses? You know, what a, a terrible, you know, life it would be. We'd walk in front of a car and just be knocked over, okay? So, yeah, I am pro-technology. It doesn't mean that uh, humans don't have to manage the technology. And um, I, I am a believer in uh, techno-ethics, which is that uh, we have to always think about the ethics of technology and to use it in a wise and balanced fashion. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of people that are still afraid. And what do you advise? How can we each, how can each of us start today to see technology as a positive thing and nothing which works against us because robots are taking over our lives? So I think as important as learning how to read and learning how to do math, you know, these are like essential requirements and skills to develop technology. Equally as important is to learn ethics, starting at the earliest ages of the primary school for, for children. And I believe the fundamental ethic of uh, technology is that none of us have a right to affect another person with our technology unless we have the consent of that other person. So you cannot sit there and impose a technology on people without their consent. The obligation that comes back from that is that uh, we ourselves will not be imposed upon by somebody else's technology without our consent. Now we have um, societies and governments and the whole communities. So consent can be given on behalf of hundreds of people, millions of people, even on behalf of the whole planet. But it's uh, wrong and it's unethical to impose a technology upon somebody without their consent. There was a great uh, German philosopher, um, I think he's probably still alive, Ulrich, um, Ulrich Rich Reich, I think is his, I'm sorry, Ulrich Beck is his name. And he came up with this brilliant idea that the uh, side effects of technology are the pollution of technology. So when a technology hurts other people, inadvertently, that's a pollution. And you should not have a right to build a factory and pollute everything in your neighborhood without the consent of the people who are sucking in that smoke. Same with technology. You don't have a right 
to create the technology without the consent of the people affected by the technology. Mm. I think that was the perfect last sentence because I think our session is already over. But um, generally speaking, for all people um, watching and listening to us, I think this is something we can definitely keep in mind your words that all of us who are using or even building technology, it's on our responsibility also to educate people about it and also maybe think one minute longer about what am I doing, even if we can't forecast everything, really be aware and not try for success and money, right, in this case. Exactly, Laura, totally with you. Thank you so much, Martin. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you, thank you Martin, and thank you, Laura.